Cool. So this is a video I kind of wanted to make for a little while now. Um, it's not like a tutorial, like I'm just some weirdo in his basement, right? Like playing with rockets. Um, but it's how I make uh, composite tubes, like uh, carbon fiber or fiberglass, like like this kind of stuff. If you're interested in how you can make this sort of easily, I'll show you the way I do it. I'm sure there's a lot better <laughs> methods out there. Um, but I figured, you know, if someone knows better than me, maybe they'll leave like a comment down below or something. So uh, again, not a tutorial. This is just kind of like the tips and tricks I've learned myself and I just want to share with other people so they don't have to like <laughs> take as long as I do to figure out how to get this done. So you have to get your raw materials. I just got carbon fiber from Solar Composites. Um, just regular plain weave. Um, I didn't really need twill because I'm just making a cylinder. I didn't need it to conform around weird edges or anything. I also got their blue silicone coated peel ply. Um, that worked really well for me. And then for Mylar, I just got cheap Amazon stuff. It's aluminized though. So like the outside, I don't know how to explain this. The, this side can touch your composites. If you let this side come in contact with your epoxy, it's gonna peel off and be part of your laminate. Um, you can check to see which side is like the aluminized side too with a multimeter, it's conductive. So um, if you lose orientation or forget which side was which, just make sure the side that is conductive does not touch your composites. So that's easy. Your epoxy, I just use the solar composites epoxy as well. Um, you're gonna need a mandrel. Now it has to be something with like really good uh, tolerances in terms of like roundness, straightness. Um, so a lot of people use aluminum tubes. You're not gonna get by with PVC most likely. Um, most other pipe kind of um, isn't consistent enough in diameter um, to work. So I ended up just using the biggest motor tube I have for whatever diameter I'm doing. Um, this is a 75 millimeter, 7,600 case. Um, the only downside is <laughs> if you're gonna fly this motor in a rocket, it means your tube has to be in two pieces because you can't make a tube longer than the motor case, right? Um, so you're gonna have a seam somewhere, which I normally do down by the fin can, um, and that's worked fine for me. Yeah, so once you get your mandrel, um, basically you just gotta cut out all your cloth to length. A really cool trick to get that done, um, or to do it straight, is if you just peel one of the t lines of toe out of the fabric, it'll leave you like a perfectly straight line to trace. I find the Fisker uh, rotary cutters that like quilters use are really good at cutting carbon fiber and fiberglass, so I use those on all my composites now. Make sure you have a cutting mat below them, because that disc, that cutting disc, will cut right through the fiber <laughs> and cut whatever's below it too, so don't ruin your coffee tables. Okay, some quick <laughs> tips and tricks. Uh, 1500 watt space heater when your garage is 45 degrees is a good idea. Um, keep your epoxies warm. I like to stir with a uh, popsicle stick and an electric drill. This is the setup. Um, basically the cloth feeds from the bottom, goes on the mandrel. The mandrel, like we discussed, is just a motor case with two layers of mylar. This is just plain scotch tape. Um, the first layer, there are two independent layers, so the first layer has its seam 180 degrees from here. Tacked in with just a couple, couple pieces of scotch tape. And then on this one, I run the scotch tape the whole length so the epoxy doesn't get in between the layers. Um, what's up, kiddo? Yeah. Hey. I want to watch Storybox. Okay, go ask mom. Anywho, <laughs> um, what else? Uh, these notes are like super helpful. So this is the weight of the cloth. Uh, I think I'm adding like 30% to the epoxy. So that's the total amount of epoxy I want. Using the mass ratios they recommend. So 100 to 18 parts, you end up with this for resonant hardener. Weigh your cup and your brush and write it down because if the scale turns off when you're in the middle of pouring one of these for some reason, that way you can subtract out your tear weight um, if you lose it. So this is the total goal. And then basically I'm doing five layers. 
I want to use about 52 grams a layer. So I wrote down my anticipated weights of the cup and the epoxy after each layer. So I can kind of spot check and see, like, am I going too heavy, too light? Um, Pre-cut your peel ply. That's the solar composite uh, silicone coated release paper or whatever they call it. It's awesome. It works just as good as the aircraft spruce uh, Teflon coated stuff. That's there, but it's like less expensive. Um, yeah. So this is my biggest carbon fiber layup yet. Um, we'll see how it goes. Cool. So I mixed the epoxy for about five minutes. Um, Basically, I'm going to paint a layer on the mandrel first of epoxy and then use this seam to line up the uh, selvage edge, slevage edge, whatever, of the fabric uh, to start off nice and square. And then we're just going to wrap around. So the way I'll tend to paint the epoxy is I'll go across in a layer and then wrap down like this on the cloth. Um, it's not necessary yet, but I'm just kind of practicing that motion. All right, so now you want to find your seam and line up the very edge of your cloth with it. And try to make this as straight as possible this way your fabric has a nice pattern when it's all done and so you can see that seam in that mylar and there's the very tips of all my fibers almost lined up within a sixteenth of an inch or so Whoa. This is when it's nice to wear gloves and embrace the stickiness. All right, so now I'm gonna take epoxy and just paint backwards to lock in that location. And in fact, the first like half layer, you're almost gonna paint backwards. So again, that kind of like sideways, spread your epoxy, and then you're pushing it radially, I guess would be the term. Once it starts loading out, it starts really sliding around. That's why you want to try to line that up the best you can. So you're trying to like push down. That's why you cut your brush a little bit. So it's nice and stiff. And these are just the cheap Harbor Freight brushes. Um, and then the ends, you kind of like paint sideways, but don't do it too hard because you'll start ripping fibers out. So you're kind of just gently cleaning that up sideways. Going linear like this. Making sure that edge you started is still sticking down. Maybe hit that again real quick. All right, and now from here on out, you can only paint this direction because you're trying to like wind it tighter onto the mandrel as it goes. And honestly, go wetter than drier. Um, the peel ply we're gonna use later will squeeze the epoxy out and sweat it out. But if you're too dry, you're gonna end up with air voids. It's another good reason to use the slow epoxy so you're not like in a rush. <laughs> Um, I've got hours to get this done if I needed it. Um, I'm hoping it only takes an hour, but I'm not in a panic. All 
All right, so now as we approach that seam, we want to make sure the first and second layer line up real good. And you can adjust that by sliding your bottom kind of feed left and right. Looks like a pretty decent overlap. And so remember those fibers, we want to make sure that they're all, the ones underneath are all going that way. The other thing is try to make sure when you're like, you're pushing the top, cause here it's pulling away from the tube anyways. So you kind of want to push to there and then kind of stop. I'm gonna go kind of heavy to try to push these last little fingers down on this edge. And try to like go super straight so they're in a nice straight line. This is the next trick though. To get that seam right up there. I'm gonna do this a little ahead of the seam to help try to keep those fingers down. Get that somewhat straight. Then you paint this right on. Um, wetting this out helps make sure your final layer is nice and smooth one <laughs> and if there's extra epoxy it can actually sweat through this fabric so don't worry about there being too much and what's nice is that you can kind of see the white spots where it's not wet out too so that's helpful And there's enough of this for like one and a half wraps. Wherever you see white, just massage it in. So there's the original seam. I want to make sure it's nice and tucked there and that there's no air bubbles along it. All right, and then just go over. So all the excess epoxy is going to sweat through this fabric. Um, but if you see any air bubbles just kind of tap them in with a brush if you had like a rotisserie it'd be nice to just have this constantly spinning for a while i'm not that fancy um so what i'm going to do is i'm going to put it in kind of a heated box uh about 100 degrees for like i don't know four to six hours um and the epoxy is just going to drip out of this so make sure that seam you had is facing up because um, all the excess epoxy is going to pull on the bottom, and if it pulls along the seam, it just makes it harder to separate the next day. Um, I've made that mistake, and it's, it turned out fine, but um, yeah. Let's let that just sit for a bit, and we'll rotate it a couple times. The curing oven is a 1,500-watt uh, space heater. Well, it's set to 750 into a cardboard box with a uh, 
baby monitor, <laughs> fire extinguisher, and smoke alarms. So um, I let that get to about 100 degrees, and then uh, it sits for like four to six hours, and then it kind of ramps down to whatever the temperature upstairs is. Cool. So 100 degree cure for, I don't know, six or eight hours. Um, put it upstairs where it's like 70 degrees. And now we're down in the basement for like 10 minutes. It was 40. I just picked this up and slammed it. And now, now it comes off that easy. Absolutely incredible. All right, it's the next morning and I'm literally in my pajamas because I wanted to share this. This peel ply works fantastic. Here we go. Wow. Look at how easy that came off. little seam right there and then I cured this for like I don't know four to six hours elevated to like 100 degrees so I suspect the body tube <laughs> I suspect the body tube like expanded with the heat and then the cure set so it slides right off so easy so good all right and then what I'm doing to square these up is just 3D printed like a pipe clamp. Uh, clamp it on there and then wet sand it like so. All right, so we did some wet sanding with 220 grit. Kind of killed me when you have like a really nice finish like this and you're just scuffing it up, but we're gonna put a neat coat of epoxy on it and make everything super shiny again. So that's the next step. All right, yeah, so that's basically making the tube. Um, to get them looking really nice, this this is actually a fin can I flew out at Argonia lately, so it's it's kind of dirty. But to get them looking shiny and smooth, I just put a flood coat of epoxy on them. So that's just neat epoxy um, over it. And then if you wanted to get really picky, you could do that, wet sand it, do it again. You could do that as many times as you want. And you could eventually end up with a mirror, like, mirror smooth finish if you wanted. I am just not that particular yet, so. All right, so we've done our solvent wipes. We've mixed up 50 grams of epoxy and we're just doing a flood coat. So you can kind of see what it looks like before you put that extra layer on. It's kind of all rough and faded and then it's gonna look nice and shiny after. Uh, yeah, this is kind of how I make tubes in a nutshell.